Hey, it's Coach Roy for RPG Training Systems, and I'm here with Sarah Pavin. Sarah, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Well, thanks for joining me. We had a quick chat last week about kind of what this was going to look like. And then uh, the funny thing was your post highlighted a, a few of the things that I wanted to touch base on. So this is going to be kind of a deep dive into the life of a champion. That's what we called this this segment because you've been at the top of your game, at the top of the class for the last few years, several years, uh, both with Melissa and with um, Heather. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce your last name. Bansley. Bansley. Yeah. yeah, sorry, Bansley. I knew that before. Um, <laughs> I'm ad-libbing as we go. So uh, so I wanted to uh, take some time to kind of deep dive into a lot of these things because I think with, I mean, what's going on currently, but also just the maybe the perception of what an elite athlete does during a regular day or even during a during a peak season is something that much, many people might not get a, get their heads around. So I wanted to go into a deep dive on uh, like what you're doing with your consulting business right now, which is really cool. And I know we're working on that together. Your relationship with Melissa and partners in general and how you work with those. And then also what your training looks like. I mean, this is a training podcast so or training uh, webinar. So it'd be cool to get to, to know a little bit about your training cycle. but. Like, what are you up to these days? What's what's kind of your COVID uh, life like? Yeah, um, somehow I feel like I'm more busy now than before. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how that happened, but like pretty much every single day I'm trying to work out, um, whether that's like strength training, conditioning, mobility, um, prehab. Um, I just want to be as fit as possible when I'm able to go back to competition and to practice. So I'm working out pretty hard six days a week. Um, I'm taking some online business classes. So through Queens University. So I'm doing that. Um, I am exploring a bunch of my hobbies. Um, I like to do pottery. I'm kind of a grandma. Uh, so fun things like that. And yeah, just a bunch of stuff that I've kind of put off for so long because I was too busy. Um, I've started doing now. So it's been actually a really good time. Sweet. That's awesome. What have you made? What pottery have you made so far? Make like I'm a bowl doing or... a lot of bowls. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I can't really get my walls a consistent thickness and stuff like that. So I told everybody I know to expect bowls for gifts for the foreseeable future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Sarah Pavin bowl collection. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're they're pourable. You can pour things. It's very easy because the walls are all dented. And... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm awesome. working on it, trying to perfect it. Hey, that's good. I, one thing my we keep talking about in the houses we're like we're in this time now when my girls are starting to learn how to write and read and and oh, i get kind of frustrated with not being able to read something i'm like look it takes years to get this so just keep practicing you're fine like this so is luckily, the worst thing you will ever learn in your whole life it's only downhill from here so yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 exactly so you're you're working out six days a week that's that's intense is that high intensity is it strength training right now like what do you what's your off season i mean this is technically your in season uh so how has that shifted your programming mm -hmm. with uh with brian um we're kind of considering this the second off season because we don't really know when we're gonna play again yeah so I am somebody who just loves training and I like to go hard all the time. And if you tell me something, I will follow it to a T. Um, so Ryan, you know, likes to try to hold me back a little bit. Um, but <laughs> seeing how long COVID has been going on in the quarantine, he's kind of like, let the wheels off and I'm just kind of doing what I want. So, okay. um, I'm really lucky I have a gym. Um, my biomechanist, his facility is empty. So he's letting me in there three days a week. Oh, excellent. And I'm doing strength training, um, typical off season stuff. A lot of like a really long warm up with a lot of like hip and shoulder maintenance, um, doing like a day of explosive lifts, a day of deadlifts, and then a day of more like single leg um, stability and strength. Um, 
So we're doing that. I'm doing conditioning, running hills, um, intervals, uh, hit workouts, anything like spin bike, and then just mobility because now I'm sitting a lot more um, mm -hmm. due to COVID. I'm in my house. Um, so just like keeping my body moving, my, my back, shoulders, uh, hips, just so that when I'm ready to go back and play that I'm not going to fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's a lot. So uh, it, I have a question about that because I mean, with the wheels off a little bit, there's more, I'll call it like general preparation stuff. How, how individualized is your program either now or even in season? How much kind of focus is it on your specific needs as opposed to just creating a general program that, that kind of runs for everybody in the program? Yeah. So my program is designed for me. Um, I have a very unique body type. Um, I'm very, very. T oh. Sorry, go ahead. That was, no, we got cut off there. No, it's okay. I have a, a very unique body type. I'm really tall. My levers are very long. Um, so exercises that a smaller person might be able to execute with no trouble, like just based on how I'm built, it wouldn't be safe for me to try to do that or smart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my strength coach designs programs based on my position as a blocker and typical movements that I will have to execute at a high level. But he also takes into consideration my body, um, any physical problems I've had in the past, any, any weaknesses my body has. Um, and that's very personal to me. Um, not everybody's the same, not everybody's injuries or history is the same. Um, so to think that we all need to do the same program is, would be crazy. Yeah. Um, so I am always working on things that are specific to my weaknesses and that allow me to train in the safest way possible for, for my body. That's great. And I'm, I'm glad we, we touched base on that because that's one big thing about the program that that I've established is, you know, I'll spend three, four hours looking at the assessments, tailoring it to the individual needs and then reassessing it after they're done a phase, just because I don't think people really appreciate what a, an individualized program looks like until they've had one. And then they go back to like a generic one you can just download online and, and uh -huh. see the intent, the immense difference that it plays. So I just wanted to, to deep dive into that a bit because that's, I think uh, somewhat of a lost art or something maybe people don't necessarily appreciate that much, especially at an elite level like yours, where every single movement is fine. It has to be fine tuned to be able to perform at the at your best. Yeah, totally. And I know like it can be discouraging sometimes when I see a really little girl with really short arms just repping out pull-ups like it's no problem. And it's like, well, if I'm hanging off of the bar, I'm pretty much touching the ground. So to pull <laughs> that far up, yeah. it's just like the physics behind it. It's just, <laughs> so just getting away from like comparing to other people and understanding the physics of your own body. And, you know, even something like a hang clean for me with really long femurs to do a hang clean from the floor, the angles just don't work. Yeah. yeah. So it's about modifying um, and finding what works. So that's super important. Oh, absolutely. So, so we're getting into programming a bit because I, I like this is where my kind of passion lies. So you're in kind of a secondary off season ish time. What, what would it look like right now? Had you been had kind of, let's pretend that none of this happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're right in the middle of end of May actually, and you would be shifting into, into kind of your pre season or in season phases at this mm -hmm. point. So what, what does then that look like from kind of a, a scheduling standpoint, like daily, let's just look at a typical day for you and how many hours you commit to certain things. So what's a typical day in season look like? Um, so yeah, we're kind of separated, I guess, into three phases. So off season, pre season and in season, mm -hmm. um, off season is a little less intense cause we're obviously trying to recover from the season. Um, but also stay in shape. Preseason is when the intensity really, really ramps up. Um, and that's doing a lot of strength and power 
lifting. Um, we're going hard in the gym four days a week. We're on the sand five days a week. Um, and we're conditioning on top of that. So we are just really putting our bodies through the grind um, and just like building that resilience and getting as fit as possible so that we're primed and ready to go. And then in season, we're traveling a ton. Um, we, I mean, last summer, we ended up being on the road together for eight weeks straight. Um, wow. And it was a different country every single week. I think at one point we did a complete uh, around the globe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I, I remember following that on Instagram. You guys were basically at a new tournament in a new country every yeah. week. It was the Melissa and Sarah tour <laughs> of the continent. <laughs> And that's insane. And it's yeah. intense. And, you know, obviously we're trying to go deep into tournaments. So during a season, it's really typical for us to, to lose weight, to lose strength. Um, and because we're not in our routine in a, in our gym. So that's why we want to enter the season as strong and as fit as possible. Um, so in a normal in season, we will play um matches from hopefully if we're doing well from wednesday to sunday that's when okay. the tournaments are um you know we'll have a recovery day slash travel day uh right after the tournament ends we'll try to get a lift in as soon as we arrive at our next destination just to get the flight out of our bones and just like prime our bodies to start it up again um but that, our would, be like a, that would be like a monday yeah usually we'll arrive yeah. somewhere on a monday do a lift a short move around practice on tuesday we'll do like a legit practice and then we'll start training i mean sorry playing um so that is just basically resting up preparing watching video and just doing everything we can to to perform our best yeah i, I i'm kind of keying in on a few things that i that i think are important to understand uh for whoever's watching is like the amount of kind of lead up in that kind of ramp up phase. Um, that's, I mean, in a typical kind of cyclical season for a volleyball player, I mean, in, in Ontario right now, it's kind of October to mid May. Yeah. So there's kind of, if you think about the amount of time that they have off, there's a very short window for off season to kind of repair and, and stuff. But then the, the ramp up, should start kind of july august because then they're they've got like a three month ramp up and they want to be at kind of peak position and the thing that we do in our training in season is we try to just maintain like do some strength work but you know we're maybe limited to one day a week just like this just like you guys are because we, we're not really pushing for a lot of gains we're trying to keep movement clean and efficient um, and then it's predominantly focused on the technical and the tactical skills so I think it's really important that you that you point that out because that's that's huge. And I guess being in the second off season, you guys are <laughs> really ramping up your training again, just to make yeah. sure that you're healthy for 2021 when we all go back yeah. inside. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, even with indoor though, it's it is different because playing professionally indoor, the seasons are so long. And I think that we can. It's we're in season. We can coast. It's just practicing and playing, but. Um, because the seasons are so long, it is important to maintain your strength and conditioning even then. So when I was in college or playing professionally indoor, we were still lifting twice a week. Yeah, um, okay. The workouts obviously looked different than, than they did in the preseason or even in the off season, but we were still working hard because the season was so long. Yeah. Um, so strength and conditioning has been a really, really important part of my life for too long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you date yourself, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. People get older, it happens, but. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. No, I, I, so, so you're living down in California now. How is that changing your, I mean, again, we're not considering kind of COVID right now, but how does that influence your, your off season? You're nice longer during the year. You're not in Canada as long. So are you, getting out more in the off in the kind of traditional off season and doing work on the courts or are you taking it off and shutting it down? How does that, how does your typical off season look? Yeah, 
trying to think back and remember. <laughs> um, Good old days. <laughs> yeah, so when I thought it was the real off season, um, we had had a really long season, so I just kind of wanted to give my body a break from volleyball. Yeah. Um, so I find the off season is a great time to do things that I don't normally get a chance to do. Yeah. Um, so that's like taking spin classes, like doing yoga, um, you know, playing tennis, just different movements for my body. Um, I've been a multi-sport athlete my whole life and just, I, I honestly attribute that to my career longevity and my lack of injuries is just I played so many sports growing up and so I try to get back to that um, in my off season but I'll still head into the gym and lift weights three or four times a week. Um, okay. So yeah, I never stop lifting. The, the types of lifts and the objectives behind my lifting sessions change, um, but I still think it's important to keep, keep up my strength. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm <clears throat> coming from a foot, coming from football, our off season is forever. Like <laughs> most of the year is our off season. So yeah. there's a lot of time to train in the gym. So I, I could, I could appreciate the, the shorter windows that you guys typically deal with and, and how grueling a traveling schedule like yours must have been last year. For sure. Yeah. So one of the other things you talked about in your, in your post was what keeps you busy. So you're kind of doing your, you're doing your pottery, you're doing your, your business uh, degree. Um, do you want to go into a little bit on, uh, actually, sorry, I want to shift focus away from kind of the day to day. And I want to get into um, what motivates you as an athlete? Um, because it's one of the things that like the, the RPG for me is the relentless pursuit of greatness. So what, what has you every year kind of go back and motivate yourself to keep kind of pushing and, and moving and keep challenging yourself as an athlete? Um, I think the tagline that you just mentioned, the relentless pursuit of greatness is absolutely perfect. Um, yes. and I think <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> defines me as a person. I just find so much joy and I get so much energy from trying to be the best. The pursuit of excellence, like invigorates me it like I love it I love practicing I love you know setting goals and um trying to reach them I love progress and getting better and everything that comes with it so I set a goal when I was a, such a little kid that I wanted to be the best volleyball player and then every single decision I made from that point on it's intense what five-year-old does that but yeah. it changed it every decision i made from that point forward was to reach that goal and i even now i'm 33 and it's like i love getting better um and i still want to be the best so i absolutely adore competing um i love practicing um so yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't see that going away. Um, yeah. Winning is, yeah, winning and pursuing greatness is what keeps me going all the time, every single nice. day. That's, I, I, I created a bit of a distinction when you said that, because you said you set that goal when you were five years old, and every decision you've made after that point has been around that kind of primary goal of how to be the best at, at, at volleyball. And I think that's something important for people to understand is it's not like, a, oh, I'd be, I'd like to be good at this. It's like your entire, like every, every, um, everything that you look at is then filtered through that decision mm -hmm. to be the best. Like, am I going to eat that thing? Well, no. Does that take me to my goal? Well, no, it doesn't. So don't, it's not even a part of the, the conversation anymore. And I think that's maybe where people sometimes get lost in the, in the, you know, the decision making and, you know, is this what I want to do? Is this what I want to do? It's like pick something, go at it with everything you got and just don't, don't rest until you get there kind of thing. And if yeah. it doesn't fit, don't do it. Right. So. And it's, it can be a little like harsh or a reality check sometimes. Cause I go and talk to people and I'm like, or to kids or clubs and I'm going to, and I say like, you know, you might think that you want this, 
but you probably don't. <laughs> yeah, but you don't. <laughs> what, yeah. what are you willing to do to make this happen? And a lot of people call it sacrifice. And honestly, I believe that if you love something enough and you want it bad enough, then it's not sacrifice. It's joy and it's, it's a pleasure to be able to do that. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I did not have a normal childhood. I did not have a normal high school experience. I didn't go to parties. My friends barely saw me. I didn't have a boyfriend, but like I didn't care because I was loving what I was doing and I loved training and going and doing one-on-ones in the, on the weekends. And it was just all consuming, but in a good way. So if you think that you want it, like really think to yourself, do I though? Um, yeah because it's it's intense yeah well, it's, and it's really poignant that you said that too it's not it's not a sacrifice if it doesn't kind of fit within the scope of what you're intending anyway right like some people say well oh i don't get to do this with this thing you know i don't you know i don't get to go see my friends well, it's like but is that you know if you're so focused on it does that even come into your vision anymore like it doesn't yeah. It doesn't even become a, like I said, it doesn't become a conversation. If it doesn't fit within the path, it doesn't fit, right? And that's that's the reality that I think some people, especially, and I'm going to say especially now with social media, but I think it's it's always been there. I think right now it's just more prevalent because people maybe just are outside of themselves so much and they're such into their technology or what other people are doing that they don't actually reflect on what they want. They kind of just start chasing rabbits around yeah and trying to figure out what other people want to do or what they think they should do so i think it's tough too because social media shows us the glamorous side of it um and there are moments that it's glamorous but a lot there's a lot of tough times too and i know there's been a lot of tears a lot of you know self-doubt or questioning or whatever um so i'm not sitting here saying it's easy but it's definitely worth it. Um, so I think sometimes social media gives us all a, a false impression of what it really looks like to, to get there and to pursue the highest levels. Yeah, oh, I love that. That's great. I could talk probably about that for the next, <laughs> for another hour, but I'll move on just for the sake of, just for the sake of getting into this other these things. So um, the, the next part, cause that, that, Winning is is a big thing, and and I quickly told you when we first got on the phone, our, our kind of semi six degrees of Kevin Bacon story is that my wife played for Fernand Humana, and Melissa was always around practices. So even when I was a strength coach at, at York, she was around practicing and playing. So I kind of knew of her or knew that she was going to be something big because she was already impressive as an athlete. I think she was maybe thirteen or like that when she was there so how is it competing with her because you, I, I feel like in order to again be at that level like you said you have to kind of commit to winning and I think that she's got a similar mindset so how is the relationship or how close are you with Melissa uh, both I guess in season but also now with everything being shut down do you guys still communicate do you talk like what's what's the relationship like um when we're in season we're obviously together like four hours a day that was kind of an obvious question yes <laughs> sorry um out of season we kind of give each other our space um just because we're together so much for like eight months of the year um we kind of just like take a deep breath and give each other space um when we're not together so i mean we've messaged each other i'll probably hear from her a couple times a week or once a week now um but usually it's like every single day um but i think you know melissa and i complement each other really well both on and off the court um you know on the court our skills like my weaknesses she more than makes up for with her strengths and like things that she might struggle with like i'm able to help in that regard so on court our skills are are very complementary but you know even as people um 
were a good match because I mean I think it's obvious to everybody Melissa is a very outgoing and bubbly person and um, you know she's definitely an extrovert and likes to socialize and is friends with everybody um, and I'm definitely more reserved um, I'm definitely introverted um, I come across as being very very serious um, and incredibly intense um, and I, I, I am when I'm working, but aside yeah, yeah. from work, I, I'm pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think our personalities just mesh really well. And even yeah. our on-court personalities, you know, she brings the joy, I bring like the intensity and I'm calming. I'm a calming presence, I would say. Um, and I think that has served us really, really well. Um, yeah. You know, at this level that we're playing at, absolutely everybody's really good at volleyball. Um, and I think the big difference, especially in beach volleyball, is the, the teams that you see really being successful and, and who are in conversations for gold medals are the ones who have really nurtured their relationship. Um, and being an indoor player for most of my life, it's something that I undervalued. Um, just because there were so many people on the team, personalities could be diffused and I could just like be whoever I am and it's fine. Um, my intensity doesn't work with a lot of people I've come to realize and it was definitely magnified on the beach and, yeah. um, it has been a great exercise in, in really knowing and understanding the person I'm standing on the court with and really being everything that I can be for that person. Um, in the good situations, the bad situations, and everything in between. So um, I think a lot of our success this past season had to do with how we nurtured our relationship and really came into a place of comfort um, with each other and with our coaching staff. And um, it's been a really, really cool evolution for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. That's because uh, I want to get into some of the some of those strategies because a, a lot I mean I've this is now my third business that I've that I've started and I've had partners most of the time and there's kind of new problems and new things to address and I know you were with Heather for a good stretch of time you guys did amazingly well and then shifting over and working with Melissa I'm curious over over the that kind of evolution what have you developed I mean I'm going to say communication is probably the number one thing that you guys work on regularly, but are there any uh, tactics or strategies or um, uh, do you go to classes together? Do you go to you know, workshops together, like those types of things to work on the partnership? Or is it just, hey, you're a good person, I'm a good person, I'm intense, you're intense, but in two complementary ways, let's go, let's have at it. Or do you kind of deep dive into into other strategies like that? Um, we've definitely put a lot of work in. Um, we have a sports psych um, that we work with. Yeah. Um, so we meet with him individually and we talk through our own like strengths and weaknesses and, and how we are feeling in the partnership. And then we also meet as a team and we bring those individual discussion pieces together. Um, you know, it wasn't always perfect um you know i learned a lot in my partnership with heather in in what i need from a partner but and also how i may be perceived by my partners and how i need to um, be more aware of that um so that growth at the end of my partnership with heather really helped lay the foundation with melissa because i didn't want the same things to happen um and yeah, we've, we've both grown a lot as individuals. Um, but I think the big thing is just understanding that like, no matter what is said or what we might bring up in these like sports psych meetings, that it's all coming from a place of love and from a place of us trying to improve our team. Um, it's, you know, sometimes like she might say something to me or I might say something to her that like on instinct could be taken the wrong way but it's coming from a place of trying to improve our team and um, I think when we really approach everything through that lens um, it makes everything so much better so you know that's everything from like how we receive feedback to our body language to 
asking, being able to ask for help and vulnerability and, you know, you name it, like we have gone over it. So it's definitely a lot of work. And I'd, I'd be lying to you if I just said it was just like that. <laughs> You guys both show up and win some championships. No big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great. Because I think, I mean, the, the thing that you touched on with relationship or uh, in relation to kind of a team-based approach, because, again, most of the athletes that are going to be in this program or watching this likely are playing at a uh, club level right now. And so even if they are beach athletes, their predominant in-season is going to be uh, focused on club volleyball and court volleyball. So having the ability to kind of learn relationship strategies, learn that kind of perceptive cueing, uh, like learning about yourself and how you, like how I, like me personally, how I project onto a crowd or how I say things and how they're going to be receiving it. That becomes very, very much a strength if you can start to do that as opposed to just like you said being a cog in the wheel and you're this personality and this person's a you know yeah. an ass over here because they do this way instead of actually trying to sit down and learn as a as a collective each of your strengths and weaknesses and what makes you you know what motivates you versus what makes you kind of shut down and, and being able to play with those things i mean that's a good sign of a, of a good coach but also just if an athlete were to take on that responsibility for themselves, how much better they would be both as a teammate, but also just kind of creating a better cohesive environment for their, for their team. Um, I think it is huge. So um, you work with a sports, like what's the, is that, um, is that kind of every week you have uh, meetings and is that kind of off season and in season? And are you doing stuff with them now during, during COVID and, and doing stuff online or how does that work? Yeah, it's a, it's a full year thing. Um, okay. He actually travels to some tournaments with us. Okay. Oh. All right, go ahead. Uh, yeah, he travels with us to some tournaments during the season. So we, we text regularly, but I'll sit down with him either individually or with Melissa at least once a week. Um, and now we are going on socially distanced walks um like once okay. every other week uh we just walk down um on the boardwalk and just like sit six feet apart and uh that's awesome yeah yell at each other <laughs> yell at each other i'm, I'm having a really big problem with yeah. this thing <laughs> i'm just gonna yell it across and hope nobody else hears <laughs> yeah um so we are in constant communication all year um, and it's it's been a, incredibly helpful um, just being in such a small team just having each of us having an outlet to, to talk about our own concerns um, but also to have somebody who wants to see us succeed just as badly as we do um, and be willing to just like be there at any time of day is is so amazing. No, oh, that's that's what you that's like the epitome of a good coach, right? Because wants it just as bad, or if not more, for your success, and then is willing to get, kind of do anything it takes to get there. Um, We've been very very fortunate to yeah. surround ourselves with people who who feel like family, and it's we're very very lucky in that way. That's good. Does that, is that similar to how yours, I mean, I'll come at it from a kind of a different perspective is when you were in high school, college, um, and even playing indoor, was the level of intention on the sports psychology as, as prominent? Obviously not, maybe not so much in high school setting, but was, was there a kind of a setup sports like at college and then in, as you shifted into professional or is this more so something that's dominated your your kind of professional career on the beach um it wasn't I don't even know if it was like a thing back mm. when I was in college um I think it was just in the last like 10 years or so that I really started noticing people doing it yes I've been out of college for over 10 years <laughs> um 
You did but, say you were 33 earlier, so I, I think we all know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I started really no doing it uh, when I was with the indoor national team. Okay. Um, we would have weekly meetings as a team, but I think it's only in the last few years that it's become like a super important part of my routine. Yeah, yeah. Would you would you recommend that as something that people start to take on earlier, or is that something that you know? Uh, like for me, I didn't really start looking into it till kind of mid university. Started working with different kind of coaches and stuff like that on the mental component. Like what one of the biggest developments for me as an athlete was what am I without my sport and looking at kind of who I am as a person. Um, so I, I've always played, I've always had a, a bit of a mind around the mental skills component, but is it something that you would say you would, would have been better off having, I mean, you're playing, you're one of the top players in the world. So it's hard to say, but would it have been something that you would have taken advantage of maybe in, in college or university, or do you think it would have been something that, you you're kind of self-sufficient you would have pushed through and then started to evolve with it as it became more prominent in, in sport i think there are different ways that a sports site can be helpful um you know as far as like um you know maybe lack of confidence in certain skills or, or feeling and how to perform or something um there's there's that aspect then there's like an interpersonal aspect of how you relate with your teammates and how you are projecting um, your feelings. And then, um, so there's, it's multifaceted. Yeah. Um, personally speaking, I have not been somebody who struggles with like, um, I don't lack confidence issues or like afraid um, or, or fear or feeling too much pressure. Like, so I don't know if I would have necessarily used it for that, but something is like in my intensity and my desire to win, um, just like being aware of, of how that looks to other people, regardless of what goes on in my own head. Um, and even just like being a perfectionist and, and always focusing in on the, the one thing I might've done badly instead of the 15 things I did really well. Um, I think I could have definitely made use of it in, for that because in the recent years that I have started to do it, it's it's improved my my outlook and my mindset and my relationships with teammates that much more. So I'm a huge advocate of of people using it and exploring it because even if you might not think that you have a performance issue, there are a number number of other ways that you could use it from how you talk to others to how you talk to yourself and totally. everything in between yeah yeah it runs the game for sure yeah I, I can't stress it enough and i i mean we were working with uh actually a girl you might know uh Kiri, uh langford who, who's one of the strength coaches at the csio um she does mental skills so she's come on board and is helping uh some of the athletes work on their performance and I think it's just something great to have as a young athlete, just learning how to see a situation and not get caught up in the, in the situation, but kind of be able to step out of it and look at it from a kind of more critical or objective standpoint, as opposed to, you know, what does this mean for me as a person? Or, you know, am I a bad person for thinking this or doing this or this, you know, whatever happened in the game, like starting to take all those things on and create identities around it then it's, it, it's interesting to start to layer, unlayer those, those onions, I think. So, yeah. Um, so there's a couple more things that I wanted to talk about. The one of, one of them is, and we kind of touched on a little bit with the sports psych and taking advantage of that, but what are, what are some key uh, piece of advice that you would give young athletes right now that are watching or that are going to jump on board or are looking to make the shift into maybe beach professionally or, or anything really that you would give advice on? Oh man, <laughs> that's a tough one. Yeah. One piece, one thing that I always say, and maybe somebody watching has already heard me say this, um, and I apologize if you have, but um, especially as a young athlete, like people, your teammates will not remember if you were the starter or if you scored the most points or if you were the best or if you were sitting on the bench, but they will remember how you made them feel. 
So my number one piece of advice for young athletes is to be a good teammate. And if you are the player who is complaining because you think you should be on the court, but you're not, that's all people are going to remember about you. If you're the player that's yelling at your team and making everybody feel terrible because you think you're better than them, that is all they're going to remember. So above all, be a good teammate. And I would say the second piece of advice would be there are so many things that are out of our control, but if you can really focus in on and like really make a commitment to the things you can control, that will take you so far. And though, in my opinion, the three things you can control are your attitude, your communication and your effort. If you are coming in with a great attitude every day, you are communicating and being really active with your teammates and you are giving 100% effort on every single ball and every single training session, that will take you really, really far. That's, I don't think I could have stated that any better myself. Like that is the, just to be a champ. I think there's a, I, I'm gonna step back. We talked about the social media perception and you know how quickly People, you know, let's say make a million dollars or, or be successful or whatever. It's, it's literally those, I would say those three factors alone are the three things that every day you can wait. I know there's a post going out that's, you know, all the things that you can control versus all the things you can't. I think there's a few of those going around, but like if you show up every day and you put on a smile, even if it's the crappiest day outside or you just got, you know, broken up with or, or something that your cat dies. If you show up with a positive, I don't know why I brought that up, but <laughs> if, if you show up with a good attitude, if you, if you, if you communicate, that was the biggest thing for me as I, I was very similar to you in that I was a very, I, I kind of self isolated almost most of my growing up and my, like my predominant was playing sports and that's really all I cared about. And I would play as many sports as I could. And so I didn't really spend a lot of time, you know, socializing or going to parties is very similar, but that also, and for me, limited my ability to have good open communication with people. So I think that's a huge one. And then the effort part is, you know, I, I can remember, I mean, I'm, I'm even, I've watched some of your videos just to get some perspective on you as a person and as an athlete. And like, you can tell, I mean, even if, I mean, we're watching, I'm watching like the highest level games that you're playing, but you can tell that every single you know step and every single position you're putting in like as much physical effort as possible and that that's not something you can just pick up overnight that's something that you've got to start to ingrain into your body and into who you are as a person it's just you know go big or go home on every possible thing because even if you mess up you've at least gone 100 percent and you're gonna you know you're probably gonna fall fall forward but you're falling and getting back up and you've created that that measured uh, progress so and i mean it. the thing that i always tell myself is like i will never leave a workout or a practice and say man i think i worked too hard today but if you only you know if you gave maximal effort and if you didn't do you want to leave practice and be like oh man i could have given more you will never regret leaving practice and knowing that you gave a maximal effort, but you will regret it if you know that you could have given more and you didn't. Yeah. And I'm going to quote that for you. I'm going to make a nice quote post for you. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go back and play that back. Oh like every word. That's great. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, I've been working out. I, I hate cardio. So we're, we're slightly different in that way. I can't stand it. If I'm on the bike for more than five minutes, I'm like, this is it. I'm done. But my next door neighbor loves cardio and he, we were doing a cardio workout the other day and, he, and I'm like, okay, I think I'm done. <laughs> I've hit my thousand meters on the freaking rowing machine. Can I leave now? He's like, no, <laughs> you gotta go do no. this. Finish. Yeah. Finish. I was like, I'm right, fine. Fine. <laughs> it's the same thing when I drag my husband to run the hills. We'll yeah. finish and he'll be like, thank you. Yeah. It's like, I, I was like, and I'm like, see, do you regret doing it? He's like, no, I am so glad that I did it. And I'm like, see? You'll never like regret conditioning. Yeah, yeah. And, it's and just a pain when you're doing it. It's a pain. It's a hard. It's the hard. You know, it's the, the old adage. It's hard to start, but once you get started, it's almost hard to stop. 
And that's, I find that, you know, for my, my AM workouts is, is getting out of bed, getting dressed, getting downstairs, prepping, foam rolling, doing everything. And the sun's not even up yet. And then I start and I'm like, okay, well, I'm already down here. So let's give it. And then by the time I'm done, I'm like, I'm so glad I did that. <laughs> like now my day is so good. <laughs> Best day of my life. <laughs> awesome. So I know you have some uh, slides that you wanted to share because one of the biggest things that uh, that we connected with initially is around your your next level consulting business. And I wanted to make sure that we had some time to talk about that because um, I love what you're doing. I think the the ability to show athletes all the possibilities that are out there is immense. And I, I know we've got some OUA coaches on the, the program and you're coming from Canada, going to the NCAA. And I, I know there's a, a ton of opportunities down there and I want to be cognizant mm -hmm. to, to say the intention is don't think that you have to follow one path to be an athlete at the next level. And I think that's what you want to want to address a lot as well or that's what you address in, in your consulting business is you know any path is a good path as long as you pick it and stick with it and, and being you know from Ontario or being from BC or, or anywhere you don't have to stay in your area you don't have to go to one school to be on the you know national team or play professionally it can happen mm -hmm. any which way so yeah. I know you wanted to share so I think you're you can share let me just pause for a second all right here we go so what are we, uh, what are we looking at? We got next level consultants. Yes. Yeah, so I started next level consulting because I feel that there's just a big lack of understanding and a lack of education about the possibilities in volleyball. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I just feel like, especially in Canada, there's a real lack of understanding that volleyball can be a real job. Um, and even there's a big understanding of like C CIS versus NCAA and like what's the right choice. So I just wanted to create this to help kids um, really learn their potential in volleyball and help them get there. Um, so briefly, we're basically a consulting agency that offers a variety of services to help young athletes um, play after high school and beyond. And I say beyond because there are professional leagues in every country around the world, except in North America, which blows my mind. Um, but it is a mainstream sport everywhere. And kids as young as 16 overseas are playing professionally. So I think Canada is a little behind in that. And if we can just like change the mindset and the understanding that we can really grow the sport in our country. Um, so we have like several services that we offer. Actually during COVID, I started doing Zoom um, coaching one-on-one -on -one, and it's been a huge hit. Um, just like setting up the tripod with your phone and like no matter what equipment you have, we create a, a practice and people have loved it. And it's been so cool to see how badly people want to stay on top of their volleyball skills and improve during this time. Um, so that's something that I just started offering and I love it. It's been so fun to do that. Um, but a big thing that we do is recruiting services. And Rory, you touched on this earlier, but I think a big part is that we offer support and guidance in making the right choice for each individual athlete. For me, my path took me to the, the US and the NCAA because that's what I felt was best for me. And I 100% loved my time at Nebraska and it was definitely the right thing for me to do. Um, for my goals, etc. But that not might not be the the thing that everybody wants to do. And you know, staying closer to home or staying in the CIS might be the choice for you. So we offer support in making that decision. Um, we have like getting started guides in like step by step of how to even get started in getting recruiting to the NCAA. Um, and we offer packages to, to help create highlight videos or to help you in your communication with coaches or how to write the letters to introduce yourself. Um, so we are right there from start to finish to help guide you through it and just figure out what's right for you because 
the four or five years that you're going to spend at university, that's a big chunk of time. And you want to make sure that you're really, really happy um, where you are. So I have a ton of experience in the NCAA. Um, and then I know a ton of people in the CIS. So I feel like my knowledge base and my connections are, are pretty sound in that regard. Awesome. Um, we also offer video services. So a lot of people, um, you know, they're on a team of 12 and it's really, really hard for your coach to see absolutely everybody at a practice. And so I get a lot of feedback of like, well, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm asking my coach, but, and that's not your coach's fault. Um, they're trying their best, but sometimes it's hard for them to give everybody exactly what they need. So that's where I come in. Um, so you could like send me your practice video or game video and I give you feedback about what you're doing really well, some of your weaknesses, um, things that you can go to your coach and ask them that you want to work on in practice or just things that maybe you should consider implementing if you want to play in college or play on the junior national team or something. So it's really a really personalized look at you and how you play and um, just gives you th um, some things to think about um, when you go back to practice. And then, as I mentioned before, recruiting highlight videos. Because um, in Canada, it's hard, you know, for the American coaches to come up or even from BC for the coaches to come to Ontario all the time. So just to like get on their radar and send them a video of you playing um, that really highlights your skills is, is a really important tool to have. Awesome. Um, and then finally, we offer mentorship services. So that's one on one video calls with somebody who's actually been there. Um, you know, I've played high school club. I played in college. I played on the national team, junior national, like literally think of any level <laughs> of volleyball, indoor or beach and I've played it. And, um, that honestly is, is rare. Um, not to like pat myself on the back or anything, but you're allowed to, <laughs> if, like, there aren't many people in the world who have played at the highest levels, top to bottom for beach and indoor. Um, so I've been there and whatever issue or thing that might be going through your head that you're experiencing right now, I guarantee you I have thought the same thing and had to work through the same exact thing. I talked about some of them with Rory even on this, on this call. So we offer like three month or one year packages so we can really get to know each other um, and video reviews are included in that. So sending in your, your game footage so we can talk about it, talk about your mindset, what you were thinking, etc. And yeah, it's basically you run the show and we talk about whatever you want with no judgment um, because like I said, I've been there. Um, so yeah, those are our, our big three with recruiting, video review and mentorship. And honestly, it's been so, so amazing to be able to connect with the younger generation of athletes um, and to be able to share some of my experience and expertise, um, especially being away from Canada. I feel like sometimes people feel like I'm not really reachable, um, but I am. And the great thing is that this is all done <laughs> online. So you can literally contact me whenever. So um, we offer free consultations for any of the recruiting services. Um, just to see if we're right, the right fit for you and to see like if we get along and to learn a bit about you so that um, I can make some really personalized suggestions. Um, but you can check us out at our website, Instagram, or you can just send an email. Um, but yeah, this has been, it's been so cool to, to connect with some young volleyball players and we actually had a girl commit to Delaware State a couple weeks ago, so that was very, awesome. very exciting. Um, and so yeah, we're here if you're interested, and it has been awesome doing this. Sweet, oh, that's awesome. Well, let's let's actually end it on that. That's good because my a my daughter is coming in, so she's gonna probably start interrupting <laughs> the, the call. <laughs> and and we'll leave it here so everyone can get a snapshot of of your contact information. What I'll do is I'll put this contact information in the uh, in a clickable link as well so people can get in touch with you. So Sarah, thanks so much for spending the afternoon uh, with me, I guess the morning there, because you're 
here in California. So uh, enjoy your lunch, enjoy the rest of your day. And, uh, and thanks a lot. And I'll look forward to our next call. Thanks so much. This is so much fun. Awesome. Take care. Bye.